In this part of the video, I'm going to show you how I assemble this board. I'll go through each of the component groups that I um, that I solder into the board, and I'll explain why I'm, I'm doing them in the particular order that I do. But before I um, start on that, it's important to talk about the, uh, the soldering iron and the tip that I'm going to use. And the reason that it's uh, more important than if you're just doing through-hole through components is that there is one surface mount component on this board down here, the uh, MAX31855 um, thermocouple processor, basically an AD converter. Now, it, the, the pin pitch on this isn't particularly big. It's 1.27 um, millimeters or, or 50 imperial mils, if you like to think of those uh, units. Um, not particularly big and it's quite easy to work with, but you need to get the choice of tip of your soldering iron right and the temperature correct, um, just to make sure that you give yourself the best chance of not having solder bridges and getting it right first time. Now in my case I use, I use the uh, HACO tips on my, on my soldering iron. I don't have a HACO soldering iron but I have one that's compatible with these tips. Um, the particular tip I've chosen to use for this job is the T18D08. Now the T18 uh, the D series is a chisel tip. I, I prefer chisel tips for this kind of work and I've got, I've got various types of them. I've got the uh, the the 3.2 millimeter chisel tip. I've got the 1.6, and for this one I'm using the 0.8, which is the smallest that I've bought, and it's a particularly appropriate for this type of surface mount work. Now Hakko also sell uh, different types of tips. I mean, if you're going to be working on surface mount um, devices, it is tempting to go for the um, the S series. The S series are are points are, have a pointed tip. Uh, but I think they're called conical on their website. And they come to a very tight, very pointed needle at the end. Um, and it's tempting to think, yeah, they're going to be perfect for surface mount work. And indeed they are for some. Um, they're particularly useful for the very, very fine pitch work, the 0 0.5, 0 0.4 millimeter um, devices, where you've really got to get in close if you make a mistake. But the disadvantage of these things is that the tip is so pointed that so little heat is transferred across that point to the device that you're actually working on that you have to really jack up the heat on your soldering iron to get the, get, even get solder to melt. So it can be quite hard to work with these conical tips and for that reason they are quite specialist and I don't recommend them for general purpose work. Um, so back to this, this particular tip. Now the, um, this is great, it's great for all, just about all kinds of work, the 0.8, the 1.6. Um, now the 0.8 that I'm going to use for this job, I've, um, I've calibrated the temperature that I require on my soldering iron by um, fitting this tip and then applying the tip to um, a, a thermocouple that's attached to my multimeter. And by fiddling around I've, uh, I've basically found out that 300 degrees as it is on my um, soldering iron is appropriate for this kind of work because it, it translates to 250 degrees roughly where the, where the um, soldering iron tip meets the, meets the device that it's, um, that it's actually soldering. Um, this will vary for you and it is best to calibrate the, um, your soldering iron and, and your tip before you start working on devices to make sure you don't overcook them um, because there's, the, the, the temperature displayed on your soldering iron is not at the tip. It's obviously back where the temperature sensor is and there'll be a big temperature gradient between where that sensor is and the, um, and the tip and then another temperature gradient between the tip and the device itself. So it's always best to test before you start using a new tip. Now the general order that I'm going to um, approach this board in is that I'm going to do the lowest components, the flattest components um, first and work my way up to the tallest ones. And the reason for that is when you're working with surface, um, sorry, when you're working with through hole components, you'll find yourself doing a lot of threading components through the board, then flipping it over and then soldering from the backside. And it's useful when you flip it over for, for, what, for the, whatever you're resting on to be able to hold the component in place while you solder the leads on the other side and then trim them off. So to make that work, you need to do the, um, the, the lowest profile components first, working up to the, to the um, tallest ones. And the lowest one on this board conveniently is the surface mount uh, MAX31855 down here. And it's also useful to work on that one first because it's a surface mount one. It's potentially the most tricky to, um, to work with if, you're, if you've never worked with surface mount components before. So we're going to work on it while we've got a clear, clear view of the whole board. Now the, so the first thing we're going to do is apply flux to these pads here. Use your best flux, the one that, the one that you trust the most. Put a nice decent amount on. Now the only really at this stage the important one is going to be the one at the top left here, the one with the dot, it's pin one. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to tin this pad um, so it's got a nice little bump of solder on it. 
and then I'm going to I'm going to come back with the components. And I'm going to hold it in place, hold the component in place with a pair of tweezers, and then I'm just going to push down on the um, on the pad so that the uh, the, the um, solder reflows onto the pin and holds it in place. And with that held down, this is called tack soldering. You may have seen it in other videos. With that held down, and you won't need to grow a third hand as you often seem to have to do with soldering because that'll be in place and the, the uh, component, what's not going to move and we'll be able to just go bang, 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 bang across the remaining pads and solder them in place. It's really easy and I'm going to do that right now. Right, for this job I'm going to be using a very fine um, solder wire, it's 0.3 millimeters pitch um, and I'm just going to touch the pad with the soldering iron and then introduce the solder and there you go it's as quick as that you just because these pads are so small it takes really no time at all to transfer the heat from the iron to the pad and then the um, the solder is because you've applied the flux the solder is uh, very eager to flow across the pad and form a nice little bump there um, because the pitch here of these of these uh, pins is 1.27 millimeters or 50 mil um, there's really little danger of causing a solder bridge and it's it's so simple to put down a little um, bump on a pad like that so now with that in place, um, we can bring out the uh, MAX31855 and try to reflow it. Okay, now it's time to reflow this little um, IC onto the pads. Um, I've already applied um, some additional flux to the pads, so it's, um, it's ready to reflow nice and smoothly. I'm going to use this, um, this pair of uh, angled needle nose pliers, um, which pliers, sorry, uh, tweezers, which I use all the time um, during reflow because they're so, it's so useful having the, the angle on the end. You can just lean over, you can just grab hold of an IC and hold it over directly over its pads without um, any any um, stress on your hands, it, everything just, just fits perfectly. So um, having already fluxed the, um, the pads here and also checked that the IC is the correct orientation, always make sure that the little dimple on the IC um, it mark, it lines up with the dot on the on the PCB there, so pin 1 um, lines up with pin, uh, pin 1, or pad 1 sorry. So. I'll just grab it, the IC and I'll hold it over the pads and let's get um, zoomed in so you can actually see what's going on. Now the, what, I'll, what the idea is here, I'll grab my soldering iron with my other hand, is while holding the um, IC down I'll simply heat the um, pad to which I applied solder earlier on and it'll reflow and stick down. That should That didn't do it, let's try again. A lot of smoking flux, but we didn't get molten solder. This is very tricky under the camera. That's better. It's tacked down now. So now with that in place, um, I can go around and easily directly solder the, um, the other pads. Right, let's see if I can get these other pads down now. This is just a simple case of normal soldering, um, iron plus very fine solder to each pad. That should be one. Off camera there I did apply a whole load more flux to this IC just to um, obviously make sure that everything flows well. In you go, in you go, in you go. I think that's, uh, that's that side done. Let's come around to the other side while keeping it under camera. And we'll go down this row. I'm still using my very fine 0.3 uh, millimeter solder here. And of course the Hakko 0 0.8, 0 0.8 tip, the chisel tip. I could probably just drag solder along here and have no problem. Let's give that a go. Just my I don't think there's any danger of um, solder bridges with um, a pin pitch of 1.27 millimeters. That looks okay, if not pretty. I think it actually does look functional. Um, what I'm going to do now is just have a quick look underneath the magnifying glass. So upon inspection, um, I'm quite happy with uh, this side over here. This looks like a good a good side. All the pins there went down well. But there's, on this side, I think two of them look a little dry. The joints look a little dry. So I'm going to go over them again with some more solder, just to make sure that they're nice and solid. Um, the, the, I've obviously, I've applied more flux, so I'm going to need it for this next pass through. The type of flux that I use, if I can just zoom out here, um, I know a lot of people don't really know if they're, if they're new to this game which type of flux, is, flux to buy. This particular one um, I bought from a company called BGA Mods on the internet 
Um, they highly recommended the Amtec Flux on their on their forums, and it's always a good sign if you go on eBay and look and you find that there are clones of a particular of a particular product there. And the Amtec Flux is cloned, and there are some dodgy ones on eBay, so don't buy them from on, from eBay. Make sure you get it from a decent supplier if you're going to get it. And this is a good flux. It doesn't leave a residue behind on the board. It's just just like a clear residue that can easily be cleaned off. It doesn't stain the board or burn or anything like that. But it does also um, activate very well and leave it um, <clears throat> and you know allow the solder to flow very very nicely. It's probably the best flux I've got. And this this little tube is probably going to last forever. These, you hardly ever use uh, much of it. Anyway, back to the job in hand. Let's grab my iron again, and we'll go back to this little uh, device and just touch it up again. That's too close to focus. That's good enough. To the centre again. Right. I'm using obviously the same solder, the same bit. I don't need to do anything different here, just go along with a bit more solder. Um, I might even try the drag technique. The drag technique is just basically load up the um, the iron with, with solder and just drag it across the pins. And if you're really uh, lucky or you've been doing it a long time, then you won't create any bridges like I just did. See if I can smooth those bridges out. Yeah, they've gone. Now that's another example of having um, you know good flux. If your flux um, works really well, then you can just you can just wipe down the pins um, if you've got any bridges, and the flux will cause the solder to wick onto the pins themselves without create without creating the bridges in between that you saw when um, I just you know, did the first pass through. So again, I'm going to have a quick look under the magnifying glass, but I'm fairly sure that's going to be a, um, a good a good um, connection now. Okay, so I checked my work under the microscope, and um, it all looks fine. The joints are all um, nicely stuck to the to the PCB. I mean, they're not pretty or anything. They're they're, they're not as good as they would look if I'd used my hot air gun or even my um, you know previous reflow reflow oven. Um, but I did say that I wasn't going to use any um, any any equipment that a typical hobbyists wouldn't have. So I wanted to stick to just a soldering iron and a pair of tweezers, so that anyone can do this. Now that we've got the, um, the surface mount uh, device out of the way, and I've given the board a bit of a clean with some uh, basically isopropyl alcohol spray that's marketed as a PCB cleaner by, uh, by Maplin, um, just to get rid of some of the residue. The Amtec Flux doesn't leave anything particularly ugly on the board. Um, it, it, it just leaves like a kind of um, like a clear but slightly tacky uh, sort of deposit afterwards, which is best to clean off. Since I've got so much space on the board at the moment with no other components in the, in the way, I thought I'd just do that. So, next uh, set of components to put in are the next, uh, the, the lowest ones, and they're going to be the resistors. So, um, obviously they're all through hull now, it's easy easy peasy work. Um, and I'm just going to go through and uh, solder them all in place. And I'm not going to bore you by showing you um, all of my soldering for just plain old resistors. The only thing I will mention is that when you're doing um, prototype work, it is definitely best to test all of your resistors before and capacitors before you put them in place. Um, it's okay if you you know if you're if you're perhaps just building or assembling a, a design that's already proven and you, you kind of trust the, um, the components that you bought from your supplier to be good. But if you're building a prototype for the first time, it's hard enough um, when you're debugging to work out whether you've got your firmware right, you know whether everything's performing correctly, without having to worry about whether you've got a dodgy component from a supplier. And it's, um, so I take every component and I just quickly test them in my DE5000 LCR meter here. It has a nice handy uh, pair of uh, slots that I can just stick, you know, legged, legged components in, um, and it'll automatically test them and report. So that's but that's a 1k resistor, and it's telling me that it's uh, 0.9979k, uh, which is it is perfectly within spec. That's a good one. And I'll just quickly do that with every component before I put them in into place. Um, it only costs a few seconds, and it could save you know hours of frustration and tearing your hair out as to why you why your prototype's not working. So off I go. I'll do all the soldering for the resistors and I'll come back. Okay, so now all the uh, resistors are in place and of course there were no dramas there as you'd expect, they're very simple components. And um, now we shall move on to the uh, next tallest components on the board. If you remember we're doing this in height order because it just makes it easier to work with these through hole components because you can just slot them through, turn, them over, turn the board over and, and rest it on a surface knowing that because you're working with the highest components on the board it's, this should stay in place, not fall back through. You can actually bend the components to help them stay in place, but it it's, gives you just that little bit of extra help if you can rely on them being the highest thing on the board at the time. So the next um, 
highest components on the board are going to be um, the diodes that we use to create the bridge rectifier, these are up here, and the ferrite beads which are used to um, filter the incoming signal from the thermocouple here, FB1 and FB2. So I'm going to get on now, get on with that uh, now and solder, it, uh, solder those in place. One thing I've just mentioned before I continue is that I have switched to my larger um, HACO uh, tip for this, for this work, for the through hole work. It's the 1.6 uh, chisel tip. Um, previously I was using the 0.8 which is great for surface mount stuff but the, the, um, you know, the, the, the through hole components are generally the leads are a bit fatter and it's easier to get some heat onto them and onto the uh, surrounding pad if you're using a slightly broader chisel tip so I'll switch to the 1.6 for this. Okay so I'll get on with that and I'll be back shortly. Welcome back. I've now put down um, quite, a, quite a, a few more components. I've put down the um, diodes, uh, the ferrite beads, um, the low profile capacitors, these are the 22 picos that work with this crystal here, that's also low profile, so that went down, and the uh, 100 nano uh, ceramic, ceramic capacitors uh, dotted around the board also have gone down. And I thought I'd take a, a quick break now, just, to, just because I'm about to start doing the transistors, because these are low profile, the 2092 package. Um, which for um, a through hole component has a, a fairly fine pitch between the leads here and the footprint that I've used on this board is a, is a straight down footprint you can see if I can get it a bit closer there you can see the footprint there it allows me to just drop in the uh, TO92 and push it right to the board so it's, it's, it fits firmly without uh, you know, the leads sticking up and flopping around in the breeze but the um, disadvantage of that is that the, the pads down here um, are very close together. If, you, if you're used to uh, soldering um, through hole components, you probably don't often see uh, pads that are that close together. So just a little advice when you're soldering. It isn't difficult. The pads are large. It's just um, if, uh, you take a clean soldering iron each time, you, each time you go in. Put plenty of flux on. And don't put too much solder. Otherwise, you will get a solder bridge between those pads, which can just be a pain in the neck to get rid of. In fact, on an early prototype of this, I did it, I, I cocked it up, and I couldn't get rid of the solder bridge. I ended up having to uh, clip the, the, um, the component out and then desolder it and start from scratch again. I didn't actually damage the pads in this process, but it was a real pain in the neck to do. Much easier to not make the mistake in the first place and take decent precautions. Okay, so I'm going to go off and do that now, um, the TO92s. In fact, there's, there's nothing else on this board that, that requires any kind of explanation. So I'll go ahead and do all of the rest of the board. And next time you see me, it will all be ready and um, looking pretty good. Okay, welcome back. Um, the board's now assembled completely, and I must say it's looking pretty good. I'm quite happy with that. I have to say there's certainly something um, satisfying about building an all-through hole board. I mean, it really looks like you've actually constructed something. You know, you have a real thing that you've built. It's, you know, sometimes when, you, when you've um, done a, a surface mount board, it just looks like a bit of, uh, you know, some flat black pieces of plastic and um, a bit of capacitive dust sprinkled across the board around them. Um, it looks a lot better, I think, when you've built a through hole board. That's, you know, something really good to look at. So I think now what we'll do is have a look around and I'll, uh, I'll explain how you know, the, um, the basic flow of control works. Now up here at the top uh, we have the, mains, the main section. It, it's divided off by uh, silk screening on the, on the board there with you know, dial warnings about going anywhere near it when it's switched on. Obviously you wouldn't do that. Um, there are isolation, isolation slots uh, cut into the board in places where the, the, um, the, the, you know, the mains part of the board gets close to the, um, to the, to the low side. Uh, to help protect uh, against creepage. I mean, it shouldn't happen anyway, but it's just, there's no harm in putting some slots in. There's a little slot underneath the opto isolator there as well that you, that you can't quite see, um, but that's, that's there but to separate the high side of it from the low side. So, um, what we have basically is um, 240 volts comes in here uh, across the filtering capacitor and then into the transformer. Um, the, you can see the triac also is, is inside there. That's not in the direct, uh, it's not across the line there. The, the triac um, is connected obviously to the supply but um, the other side of the triac uh, goes out to these oven terminals, the oven terminals out here. Um, the um, triac is uh, screwed into the heatsink uh, there by Oops, drop the board. By an um, M3 screw, which um, is it's also got some uh, thermal transfer compound on the back there. It's exactly the same kind of thermal gunk that you'd put on um, a CPU, a computer CPU. And the triac is uh, protected by a MOV. The MOV is across the triac, not across the main supply. Okay, so the uh, isolation transformer here, that's an important component um, when we're considering the overall safety of the board. 
it's the whole thing, as you can see, is encased in uh, an insulating material. And inside there, the two sides of the uh, transformer will also be separated by a piece of insulation material. Um, so that the high side of the of the transformer um, cannot short across to the low side and cause you know problems down here, you know, problems that could obviously result in serious damage and possibly electrocution. Now the transformer here steps down the uh, the mains 240 volt AC wave to um, six volts RMS, which is uh, multiplied by root two. That's about 8.4, 8.5. Um, at peak to peak uh, rating. So what we do with that is that we need to we need to uh, rectify it to get ourselves a nice DC voltage. So here's the bridge rectifier diodes. You can see them in the schematic. Now the bridge rectifier diodes feed into the smoothing capacitor here, which um, smooths out the, the the peak. So you have sort of an almost uh, an almost DC voltage that's kind of a little bit just less than the peak to peak value. So that that. Um, is then fed into these regulators here. I, unfortunately, I need 5 volts and 3.3 on this board, so there are two regulators, one for 5 volt and one for 3.3. Now, the, the output of the, um, of the bridge rectifier is roughly 6.3 volts when you take into account all the diode drops that are going on. So what I do, as well as uh, feeding the regulators, I feed that 6.3 volts down here and straight out to a fan header. That's, I didn't really know whether I would need to actively cool the um, Triac here. You can see it's already got a, a big old beefy heatsink on it and um, in the write-up for this project I do explain the thermal considerations that led to the choice of this heatsink. But um, just in case, and you, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry, I put a normal uh, standard computer fan header here. Um, and, if you, and most of the computer fans, even though they're rated at 12 volt DC, will quite happily run at a lot lower. And they'll be a lot quieter as well when they're running at a lot lower voltage. So 6.3 volts out here is usually enough to drive um, a computer fan at, at a kind of low level. It will shift air across the heatsink if I need it. I don't think I'm going to need it, but whatever, it's, it's there just in case I do. Now I'll just quickly explain the zero crossing detection circuit because um, it, it's, it's quite neat actually. It fits in quite well with the whole flow of things. So this smoothing capacitor here um, has the effect of um, transforming the, uh, it's like a, a row of camel humps, if you like, um, this, the, the output from the bridge rectifier. It, it converts into a nice smooth-ish um, DC uh, wave which can go, which can go into the, um, uh, the voltage uh, regulators here. The thing is, uh, to be able to do zero crossing detection, I need that camel hump wave um, before it gets smoothed. So the, before the output of the bridge rectifier goes into the smoothing capacitor, it goes through this diode here, and I tap off the um, anode side of the diode before it goes off into the um, smoothing capacitor. And I uh, tap it off into this, uh, through this resistor into the base of this just BOGO standard 2 n one um, NPN transistor. And then the um, collector of the transmit of the transistor is connected through this resistor to the um, to, to one of the input pins on the at mega eight down here. Obviously, the emitter is just straight to ground. So what happens is as this as this camel hump wave um, goes into the base of the transistor, the transistor will be on at the point where the um, the waveform goes up and passes uh, exceeds the you know, the gate activation voltage for this um, this, tra this transistor it will be on after that's done so and then as, as the uh, voltage goes up and across the uh, the hump it'll approach zero again and as it drops below the voltage required to activate this transistor the transistor will go off that means um, I what I get uh, at the input pin of this um, of this MCU is a nice little indicator on off on off each time the uh, the waveform passes zero, um, and all I needed to do it is just uh, three three simple, very very cheap components. Uh, well, four if you count the, the fact that I needed a diode to stop the the effect of the smoothing capacitor uh, ruining the whole thing. But um, that, yeah, that's quite neat, and it was, it's actually worked very well. This. A uh, little board sticking out here is my HC06 um, it's a Bluetooth uh, adapter board. It's basically a breakout board that I got from eBay. They cost about three quid. Um, I, I've opted to solder mine directly into the uh, board because I'm going to mount this in a case. I hope, and the case will the case will come up and go uh, so I'll surround the whole the whole board, and I'll put a, a transparent uh, perspex acrylic uh, top across the whole thing, and. 
um, the the height of the HCO6 is about the same as this heatsink here, so I'm not I'm not um, you know giving myself any problems by soldering this directly into the board. I could have I could have uh, run some wires from the edge and you know mounted this Bluetooth thing somewhere on the case side, but I thought it'd be easier just to solder the whole thing the thing directly in. Now the last thing that needs to go in is the LCD. I haven't put it in uh, j just for this little you know, walkthrough because it would obscure some of the main components in the board. I thought you'd like to see those first. So let's, let's put it in now. What it is, is um, an LCD that I got, I guess where, on eBay, which is uh, one of these Nokia 5110, um, I think it's 84 by 48 or something like that, um, resolution. Uh, it's very, very cheap and they co it comes on its own little breakout board so you don't have to faff around you know, trying to mount the thing. And I, I designed the uh, the headers, this header here, so it would slot directly into the LCD board. And I also added some holes in the board here, which um, will support the back of it, so that it can just rest nicely. Um, these these standoffs here are 11 millimeters tall. And when I place this into here, I just place the LCD into the container. It's resting nicely at the uh, on these little supports at the back. I was hoping I'd be able to screw these in, and I may just be able to. The problem with this little breakout board that the, that you get on eBay is that this, the um, the screw holes are extremely close to the LCD here. If I do manage to screw this in, I'm going to have to find some some screws with a, with very very small heads. I normally use quite large, uh, like you know, large head screws to you know, hold things in, and, and there's no way they're going to fit in there. I may not even bother because it's just quite, it's just secure enough there. It's not, it's not going anywhere. It's not going to fall out, and it's, and it's uh, protected from uh, being pushed down against any of the components below. So now, of course, I'm going to uh, have to test the thing, switch it on, and see what happens. Um, I have catered for the fact that I would need to be developing this um, you know, continuously and I don't want to be uh, connected to the mains when I'm do it, it, doing it, it's just not safe. So these little, these two jumpers here um, are in the path of the 6.3 volts, uh, roughly 6.3 volts output from the smoothing um, capacitor here into the regulators. So all I need to do is remove these jumpers and, I, and then I can supply uh, 6.3 volts directly myself into these two pins and the whole the whole board should power up without me having to um, you know, connect the mains. Obviously I can't test the triac but that's something that can be tested in isolation later. Um, you, you, I really don't want to be connected to the mains when I'm doing the, uh, the, you know, the development and testing of the low side of the board. Okay, quickly, uh, just a couple of things I haven't mentioned so far and I'll just, I'll just quickly go over just so that you know that you've got the full picture of the board. You may have noticed in here that there's um, it's an I2C um, it's a header that isn't isn't connected. I do have uh, you know, possible plans in the future for other other uses for this board. So I th and w some of those uses might require the you know the I2C or I2C depending on how you want to say it. Might need the the, the I2C bus. So I've I've connected up, up this this header to the MCU's uh, I2C output just in case I need it later on. Um, I, I probably, uh, oh, I don't need it for this design, so therefore that, that pin header is, is blank. Uh, P6 up here has got the, the programming header for the, um, for the MCU. It's, it's the ICSP um, compatible header. I, I use one of those, um, uh, the, those USB ASP programming devices, and I can connect in a 3.3 volt version of the USB ASP to this header and program and test the MCU. Over this side, we've got the, um, the, you know, the the low inputs that I need. Now here we've got the, um, the a select button. It is this is for a user interface. Uh, so, in in combination with this with this um, connector here, which is designed to connect a rotary encoder, we have a button as well. So if you're not using Bluetooth um, and you don't you know you don't want to mess around getting your phone out or your tablet and controlling it that way. You can use a rotary encoder to select menu options, and then you, uh, when you want to select something, you press a button, and the button's connected through on that select, um, you know, on that select input there, and the rotary encoder is there. Uh, this little LED here is is just an indicator that you've got um, a good Bluetooth link. Um, you'll see during the during the demonstration and testing that when um, the Bluetooth device connects and makes a good link, and I'm and I'm exchanging information um, successfully with it. This light will be continuously on. It's just a reassurance that things are working. Um, and this is the thermocouple input here. The thermocouple goes through a couple of ferrite beads to filter it, and a, a, a capacitor, a 10 nanofarad uh, capacitor across it. That's recommended by Maxim. Um, 
and then that obviously goes into the to the Maxim um, converter here, which then goes into the uh, to the to the MCU. So that's pretty much the whole thing. Oh no, it isn't. I forgot to mention the Mach 3020M up here. That's the tri the, the triac optocoupler. It's uh, driven um, through a transistor because it needs um, at least uh, 30 odd milliamps to actually work. I can't drive that directly from an MCU's pin, it's just too much. So I use a transistor to drive it and the MCU drives the transistor. The Mark 3020 is, is used for um, driving the triac. When, when I turn this uh, optocoupler on, um, on the other side of it, the uh, triac will get turned on. Um, I have to do all the timing for that to make sure it's uh, correctly timed with the zero crossing, the circuit of which I explained earlier on. Okay, so I think that's uh, almost all the board explained, um, and I think let's just get on with it and test it. I'll uh, it connect uh, a 6.3 volt uh, DC supply to this, to this header, I'll hook up the um, rotary encoder over here, and we'll, we'll switch on and we'll do some Bluetooth testing as well. Should be fun. Right, we're hooked up. Uh, let's do some testing. So I've hooked up my, uh, my DC regulated uh, bench power supply set at 6.3 volts to the input here. I've got uh, a cheapo thermocouple wire that I got from eBay on here. It's just a very common one. It costs you about two pounds to get. It's obviously it's a K-type thermocouple. Um, I've got the a rotary encoder connected here in a breadboard. Unfortunately, I can't. I'm going to mount the rotary encoder to the side of the case, obviously, when I uh, you know, when I when I put this thing together. But for now, it has to be in a breadboard so I can get the little jumper wires across and into the board. This rotary encoder has a built-in switch. If I press it down, it will activate uh, a, a switch, a select switch. Um, or I just turn it to, to ch change options. So let's uh, switch the power supply on and see what happens. Of course, I know exactly what's going to happen because I've been programming this thing for weeks. And on it comes. And the, uh, with the welcome screen, the basic screen um, is, if you're using Bluetooth, this is the only one that you'd actually see. Um, it, it waits for a Bluetooth connection and in the meantime, it, it continually displays the current temperature that's uh, being read off the thermocouple. Uh, yes, it is a very hot day today. Uh, it is actually about 24, 25 degrees in this in this room at the moment, uh, which for England is actually very hot. Um, I think this uh, um, I think this this uh, Max thirty one eight five five is reading a couple of degrees high, but it's nothing to be worried about, and it's something that could easily be compensated for in the firmware. So let's have a walk around. Oh, in fact, let's just uh, you know, show that this thing's actually working. If I grab a grab a hold of the um, thermocouple end here we should see the temperature rise in accordance with that yeah, it does very quick reaction I'm sampling it um, at once every 500 milliseconds uh, so you get you, there's, there's no noticeable lag between um, me touching this thing and it going up so okay let's put that aside now let's have a play with the rotary encoder all of the functions that you can select with the select switch here can also be done over Bluetooth so I mean it, it, you can actually operate this uh, this controller entirely by Bluetooth you don't have to um, use the this, fit of this encoder at all but obviously for my demonstrations here I've fitted every option possible so I can show it all so let's press the select button and get to a menu so we have the main options menu here you can choose you can twist the rotary encoder to select uh, menu options um, and you can pr um, then press the button to uh, go into one so uh, let's do them one by one I'm going to reflow which takes me to a sub menu here if I you may be wondering how you go back if I if I don't do anything for a number of seconds I think I set it to five seconds inside the uh, five or ten seconds inside the uh, firmware it will automatically go back to the main screen so I can choose the reflow profile let's choose leaded and I can immediately do either do it now or cancel um, obviously, because I don't have the, um, the main supply, I can't do reflow now, so I'm going to start just cancel it, let it come back on its own. It's, apologies if this doesn't react immediately when I press it. The breadboard here is a bit dodgy. The connection between the breadboard and the and the um, rotary encoder is a bit loose. So let's go back to the menu. Now, the PID um, option allows me to go into the, um, the settings screens and, and choose different values for the proportional integer and um, derivative coefficients. So if I, I, I go down and select uh, some new value, let's say 5 for the uh, proportional one, that's actually one I've found to be a particularly good one. Um, integer, I've found uh, 3 to be quite good, and derivative, I've also found 3 to be quite good. So that will now be remembered inside the EEPROM, inside the MCU, so next time we boot up, they, they will still be those same settings. Obviously, they're there now because I haven't uh, powered off. If I don't do anything for uh, 5, 10 seconds, it'll turn it back to the main screen. There we go. Um, calibration, that's a good one. You can go in and you can set, it's really an experimental option. As you um, go in here and twist the um, twist the rotary encoder, it'll count up 
uh, between zero and 100. It's a percentage value. And the idea is that you can, you can watch your oven, you can watch the lamp inside the halogen oven, and you can see when it starts to come on, because some of them may not, may be completely off until you reach a certain threshold. Mine seems to come on pretty much immediately. Um, but using this, you can set the percentage where the oven starts to come on. And the firmware will then only use that uh, from that percentage up to 100 as the active, as the range. It will treat this, it will treat this, uh, let's say it's 6% where your oven comes on. It will treat 6 as the floor and, um, for, and it will ignore 54321 when doing calculations for um, oven power output. Um, that, mine's, mine seems to come on right away, so I'll just put it straight down to zero. Again, my, my rotary encoder is not connecting well. Into this, into this uh, breadboard. Um, LCD gives LCD basic LCD options, uh, backlight and contrast. So you can you can go in and you can change the strength of the uh, of the backlight to fit. It, it, this this really is something set it and forget it, um, because depending on the module that you've got, you may find that certain brightnesses are too much and cause washout in the screen. So you can you can pick uh, whatever level suits you. So I mean this this particular module is yeah, fine at one hundred percent. It's not like this is this, there's any low power requirements here at all, is there? You can you, since we're connected to the mains, you don't need to worry about um, expending a few milliamps through the backlight. Now the um, the contrast bit is is a bit more uh, crucial. I press that I shouldn't have done. Let's go into the contrast setting. These particular STN type of LCDs um, have what they call a contrast setting, which um, it's. If you get it wrong, then you can't see anything on the LCD at all. If I bring this down, the wrong way, if I bring this down, you can see it fade out. This is uh, some kind of drive strength for the for the STN LCD. I don't really understand the technology, so I can't say what it is. But it's a common, setting this to a wrong value is a common um, problem when you're driving these LCDs and you think it's not working, um, but it is. It's just that you haven't set the contrast level correctly. Um, usually, you, you need to sort of to wind it up until it's, um, you can see the display clearly, but you, do, you um, can't see, uh, if you go too far, you get it just goes black, eventually it just goes completely black. So you want to get just the right blend so that the, um, the pixels that are off do appear to be off, whereas the ones that are on are on at a nice, um, you know, strong level. I think about 80 is good on this particular panel. It will, it will change per module, so you've got to get this contrast right, right for your particular panel. Um, and that's really all the options that you can do inside here. It's really all you need. Um, all of those options can be configured from within the Bluetooth um, uh, uh, tablet as well. So uh, you, you basically have the option to um, either control it through, through Bluetooth or you can control it through the uh, rotary encoder, either one. Okay, so let's, let's actually take a look at the, uh, the Bluetooth firmware. Right, so I've disconnected the um, rotary encoder and moved the breadboard away just to give myself a little more room here so while I'm demonstrating the tablet. Um, the unit is switched on. You can just see a little flashing LED down here. There's, the HC06 has got a red LED on board that will flash red when it's, um, it'll flash quickly red like this when it's uh, not paired. When it's paired, it'll go solid red. And if something goes wrong with the pairing, it kind of flashes like a slow blinking, uh, one like almost at one hertz level. You can tell something's gone wrong and you need to turn the thing off and start again. So this, this tablet here is um, well, it's a cheapo £35 tablet that I got on Amazon by a no-name Chinese brand called iRulu. I'm actually really very impressed with it. For 35 quid, it's amazing what you get these days. Um, now I wrote some Android firmware to um, control this oven, so let's run my little app. Um, start it up. Up it comes. It'll immediately try and make a link. You can see at the moment it's no link, red up there. Um, there we go. It's automatically made the connection. You can see the uh, white LED has come on on the, um, on the on the controller board, and the little um, indicator at the bottom has gone from saying no Bluetooth to communicating, which means that it's currently um, sending the temperature once every every second across to the um, the tablet here, so that we can watch it here. Um, let's get a bit of a closer view on here. So there you can see the uh, tablet options, I hope. Let's see if I can get the contrast on that right. Um, yeah, it's not too bad, I don't need to put the light on. Okay, so we've got uh, the profiles you can select as usual. This doesn't do any communication with the actual um, controller, it's just selecting options. So I'll, I, I select leaded because I hate lead-free solder. Um, we have the reflow option, which will immediately go through to the, um, to the actual reflow progress. We have a, a constant live temperature display. You can see down there it's um, currently saying that the temperature is 26 degrees C. And uh, we have a parameters option. So if I touch the parameters option, we can go in and we can change the, the PID settings as we like. We can change the way that the, um, that times out if you leave it. 
and don't do anything. So let's look at the tracking options. You can go uh, linear or spline curve tracking. I usually, usually use uh, spline curve. Basically, the um, when you look at a, a reflow curve, let's actually go to the, the, the chart and you can see what the spline looks like. Now the, um, the spline curve makes a much more smooth progression through the different stages of the reflow. Um, and I think I believe that actually is more you know in line with real life. You don't get sharp temperature changes in, in the oven itself. Um, it's more of a curve, so it's better to have it done this way. So if I go back, let's go back, use the back button in the Android. Um, I'll show you what it looks like if I select the uh, tracking to be uh, linear. And you'll see how the original points are. So it gets going to the reflow there. And that's what it looks like if you, if you select, if you decide to go the uh, linear route. Um, basically, I have an algorithm um, on, the, on my main PC that's able to translate uh, points, multiple points uh, on a, a, you know, a, a line chart like this into a smooth um, spline. And I use that to generate the points that you saw on the previous curve. So let's go back. Um, look at the parameters again. This, I was saying this was a very good uh, thing, but the touch screen isn't, isn't particularly sensitive. The um, settings you can change inside here. Let's go into parameters again. I can set the oven zero level, the uh, calibration that you saw. I can set the uh, LCD backlight and I can set the, uh, the contrast um, in, in just the same way as I could using the rotary encoder on the main, uh, main device. So that's it's it really it's very sensible very sort of uh, sensible and compact firmware the resolution on this on this display is uh, 1024 by 600 which is, is quite good for, for a, a 35 pound tablet i have i have tested it on the android emulator using lower resolutions and it does work it does work quite well but generally i rec i recognize i recommend um, I, I think 1024 by 600 is, is a kind of sensible minimum. You can get away with those 800 um, horizontal resolution devices quite well, or obviously any of the higher ones. If you've got um, a modern phone these days with Bluetooth, then you, you're probably going to have a much higher resolution than uh, even on these tablets. The phone resolutions are really, really high. Um, and I've, I've got a, a Google Nexus 10, which is 2560 by 1600, crazy resolution, and obviously it works well on that. So. I can't obviously demonstrate the uh, the reflow part at the moment on this because uh, I'm not connected up to the mains. I'm just going to put my settings back to the um, one where I have spline tracking, so I much prefer that. There we go. There, that curve there. What will happen um, when we do the next demonstration, which will be live connected to the oven with the mains on and everything, is that I'll be able to click the go the go uh, button here. <clears throat> And the, the, the reflow profile will be tracked as it goes over the top here and the oven will be controlled through the triac. Okay, welcome to this last segment of the um, video in which um, I'm going to show you a live demo of a reflow session. Now, the um, first thing to note is that because there is um, exposed wiring, uh, mains wiring here, um, I haven't got this in a case yet. So this demo will be entirely hands-free. Um, and I'll be conducting it um, using my uh, Google Nexus 10 here. So um, you can see that the uh, controller has the white, uh, the white light lit up there, um, which indicates that the, the pairing is, has been successful and it's receiving commands from the, uh, the tablet. Um, the, mains, the main switch I switched on on the wall there, and that's, that's the only part of the device that I'll be touching. So this is the same halogen oven that you saw in my previous reflow projects. Um, all I've done is put this K-type thermocouple um, into it and connected it to the uh, controller for this new project. And um, I'm ready now to start a reflow session. So using my app, I'll, um, I've already selected the leaded profile. That's pretty much the only one I'll ever use. Um, I'll look at my parameters. I don't think they're correct. I would like the uh, parameters here to be uh, five for the uh, proportional. I want the integer setting to be uh, three and I want the derivative setting to be three. And that's gonna be kind of okay, I think. Uh, tracking the spline curve method, I think is the uh, by far the best, so I'll, I'll stick to using that. Um, and so we're ready to go. It's telling me the current oven temperature is 23 degrees. It is quite warm in here. So if I hit reflow now, you can see the, the curve is ready. That's uh, how, how the uh, ideal uh, reflow plot will be. Obviously, uh, in real life, it's going to be off a little um, due to the, you know, the feedback from the oven and the PID algorithm. So let's, let's get started. All I have to do is click go. 
Now the first thing that happens is that the, the starting temperature is 25 degrees C for a reflow session. So the first thing it does is warm the oven up using a 30% setting until it reaches 35. And then the algorithm's off. It's off and running. You can see, if I just bring that up there, you can see I track the progress with a little uh, green marker with a nice little flashing, um, well, sort of fading, pulsing uh, bit on the end. It's just a bit of fancy animation that I put in. Now we're running the PID algorithm here with the coefficients of uh, 5, 3 and 3. And you can see on the other side of the chart here we've got um, progress being displayed, the current temperature, um, the current time through the actual uh, process, the error how hot, or too cold, how hot or cold we are relative to the ideal um, temperature on the profile and the current power being applied to the oven. Now my halogen oven is lined with um, ordinary kitchen foil here, which um, was pretty much the uh, thing that I had to do to make it follow the reflow uh, profile accurately. Without the foil covering, it, it just wouldn't reach the, um, the peak temperature at all. There was too much heat loss through the glass sides. Note that I haven't, I haven't actually bothered putting uh, foil around the top. I probably will do that because there's, the top uh, glass piece gets very, very hot. Um, and if I were to tape some uh, foil in there with some Kapton tape, I reckon, I reckon it would be even better. So the process is continuing here, it's doing quite well. You can see that you can see as it, uh, miss, as it misses the um, target and then comes back down again, the algorithm kicks in. Now I have put in um, some compensation in the PID algorithm for integral wind-up, which is a phenomenon that you can read about on the internet and it's to do with PID um, controllers. And it basically um, stops the integer um, part, the integer accumulator, um, the, uh, basically an error accumulator. It stops it getting out of control and going too high. Still doing quite well here. Current temperature is uh, 184 degrees C. So if there was, if I did have a real board in there, uh, solder would now uh, be in the, on the verge of melting. And it's kicking off again. I do think you, I really ought to get some foil around the top here. I think the um, the rate of cool down would um, decrease quite a lot if I uh, if I put foil in, which should stop the temperature dropping so fast as it as it um, the, you know the PID algorithm takes it up the curve. And if it doesn't drop so fast, it should be able to react uh, more accurately. I think to the changes. It's something I'll experiment with in due course. Right, now we're in the reflow zone. This is where the um, solder has melted and the temperature needs to ramp up quickly and keep it melted. As you can see, no problem going up there at all. The, um, the, you know, the, the foil lining really does allow the halogen oven to get up to the peak in no time. Now, as we approach the top here, the algorithm gets it overshoots quite a bit and it's because of integral wind-up if I just stop the oven by lift, lifting the handle it's got a safety feature I can prevent it getting too hot I should have done that earlier again I think the uh, the problem with white with integral wind-up is um, that you get this overshoot I think again I think um, lining the um, top of the oven is going to solve that problem now as it cools down here, the, the, really the, the easiest way to cool down these things is just to lift the top of the oven because heat, heat comes out really quickly. There, yeah, you see the temperature drop like a stone. If I just put the handle back down again, it'll actually want to warm the oven up again. I don't think that's something we should be doing. At this, at this point, normally when the reflow is complete, I just, let, I just take the top off the oven and let it fall down. Let the temperature fall all the way back down again. And we're done. That's the whole session. So you can review the, pro the um, progress on the screen and see how we've done. It's not too bad, in my opinion, there. I think, um, as I kept saying during the actual process, that the, um, that the problem with the overshoot and the undershoot 
you can somewhat address it with um, you know, playing with the coefficients to, you know, to, to reduce the amplification of the proportional coefficient to stop it gaining so quickly, perhaps reduce the integral um, coefficient to stop it um, gaining you know, the uh, integer, integer error um, term too quickly. But I think best, you know, the overall the best thing I can do is to improve the insulation on the oven, to just, just um, stop it changing, losing temperature so quickly, which causes it to then heat up so fast again. Um, but basically, I'm happy with it. That would have been a good reflow session. I would have um, had a good board out of that, I think. So there you go. That's everything. Um, all that's left for me to do now is to switch off at the mains, like that. So now the board is safe. It's powered, powered off. And I can take it apart and, um, you know, basically, I'm going to put it in a case for the um, I mean, for long-term use of this thing. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this um, video. And yeah, that's it. Please read the blog article. And if you do plan to build one of these yourself, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So this is the same halogen oven that you saw in my previous reflow project. Um, all I've done is put this K-type thermocouple um, into it and connected it to the uh, controller for this new project. And um, I'm ready now to start a reflow session. So using my app, I'll, um, I've already selected the leaded profile. That's pretty much the only one I'll ever use. Um, I look at my parameters, I don't think they're correct. I would like the uh, parameters here to be uh, far, oops, 5 for the uh, proportional. I want the integer setting to be uh, 3 and I want the derivative setting to be 3. And that's going to be kind of okay, I think. Uh, tracking the spline curve method I think is the uh, by far the best, so I'll, I'll stick to using that. Um, and so we're ready to go. It's telling me the current oven temperature is 23 degrees. It is quite warm in here. So if I hit reflow now, you can see the, the curve is ready. That's uh, how, how the uh, ideal uh, reflow plot will be. Obviously, uh, in real life, it's going to be off a little um, due to the, you know, the feedback from the oven, the PID algorithm. So let's, let's get started. All I have to do is click go. Now, the first thing that happens is that the, the starting temperature is 25 degrees C for a reflow session. So the first thing it does is warm the oven up using a 30% setting until it reaches 35. And then the algorithm's off. It's off and running. You can see, if I just bring that up there, you can see I track the progress with a little uh, green marker with a nice little flashing, um, well, sort of fading, pulsing uh, bit on the end. It's just a bit of fancy animation that I put in. Now we're running the PID algorithm here with the coefficients of uh, 5, 3 and 3. And you can see on the other side of the chart here we've got um, progress being displayed, the current temperature, um, the current time through the actual uh, process, the error how hot, or too cold, how hot or cold we are relative to the ideal um, temperature on the profile and the current power being applied to the oven. Now my halogen oven is lined with um, ordinary kitchen foil here, which uh, was pretty much the uh, thing that I had to do to make it follow the reflow uh, profile accurately. Without the foil covering, it, it just wouldn't reach the, um, the peak temperature at all. There was too much heat loss through the glass sides. Note that I haven't, I haven't actually bothered putting uh, foil around the top. I probably will do that because there's, the top uh, glass piece gets very, very hot. Um, and if I were to tape some uh, foil in there with some Kapton tape, I reckon, I reckon it would be even better. So the process is continuing here. It's doing quite well. You can see that you can see as it, uh, miss, as it misses the um, target and then comes back down again. The algorithm kicks in. Now I have put in um, some compensation in the PID algorithm for integ integral wind-up, which is a phenomenon that you can read about on the internet and to do with PID um, controllers. And it basically um, stops the integer um, part, the integer accumulator, um, the, uh, basically an error accumulator. It stops it getting out of control and going too high. Still doing quite well here. Current temperature is uh, 184 degrees C. So if there was, if I did have a real board in there, uh, solder would now uh, be the, on the verge of melting. And it's kicking off again. I do think you, I really ought to get some foil around the top here. I think the um, the rate of cool down would uh, decrease 
quite a lot if I uh, if I put foil in, which should stop the temperature dropping so fast as it as it um, the, you know the PID algorithm takes it up the curve. And if it doesn't drop so fast, it should be able to react uh, more accurately, I think, to the changes. It's something I'll experiment with in due course. Right, now we're in the reflow zone. This is where the um, solder has melted and the temperature needs to ramp up quickly and keep it melted. As you can see, no problem going up there at all. The, um, the, you know, the, the foil lining really does allow the halogen oven to get up to the peak in no time. Now, as we approach the top here, the algorithm gets, it overshoots quite a bit, and it's because of integral wind-up. If I just stop the oven by lift, lifting the handle, it's got a safety feature. I can prevent it getting too hot. I should have done that earlier. Again, I think the, uh, the problem with, with integral wind-up is um, that you get this overshoot. I think, again, I think um, lining the um, top of the oven is going to solve that problem. Now, as it cools down here, the, the, really the, the easiest way to cool down these things is just to lift the top of the oven because heat, heat comes out really quickly. Yeah, you see the temperature drop like a stone. If I just put the handle back down again, it'll actually want to warm the oven up again. I don't think that's something we should be doing. At this, at this point, normally when the reflow is complete, I just, let, I just take the top off the oven and let it fall down. Let the temperature fall all the way back down again. And we're done. That's the whole session. So you can review the, pro the um, progress on the screen and see how we've done. It's not too bad, in my opinion, there. I think, um, as I kept saying during the actual process, that the, um, that the problem with the overshoot and the undershoot, you can somewhat address it with um, you know, playing with the coefficients to, you know, to, to reduce the amplification of the proportional coefficient to stop it gaining so quickly, perhaps reduce the integral um, coefficient to stop it um, gaining you know, the uh, integer, integer error um, term too quickly. But I think best, you know, the overall, the best thing I can do is to improve the insulation on the oven to just um, stop it changing, losing temperature so quickly, which causes it to then heat up so fast again. Um, but basically, I'm happy with it. That would have been a good reflow session. I would have um, had a good board out of that, I think. So there you go. That's everything. Um, all that's left for me to do now is to switch off at the mains like that. So now the board is safe. It's powered, powered off. And I can take it apart, and um, you know, basically, I'm going to put it in a case for the, um, I mean, for long-term use of this thing. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this um, video, and yeah, that's it. Please read the blog article, and if you do plan to build one of these yourself, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have.